In this video we're going to be looking at public finance and fiscal policy. There are five main areas I want to discuss and those are the first is I want to discuss what is public finance all about, then I want to look at what is fiscal policy and then how can fiscal policy be used to manipulate public finances and the fourth is the aggregate supply and aggregate demand diagram we can use to demonstrate this and the fifth is the pros and the cons of um, public finance, um, sorry, a fiscal deficit. Right, let's start with what is um, public finance all about. Now, how you need to think about public finance is how you think about a person. Now, suppose a person um, has a business, they get £10. Now, what we're interested in looking at in this person is whether they go out and spend £15 or they go out and spend £4 or they spend £10. Then we look at the expenditure of the person. So what public expenditure is, is that you have a government, you look at the income and then you see are they spending more, that they, uh, more than they earn, less than they earn or just the right amount. So that's what public finance is. Now there's three main areas of income and expenditure for the government. And these are as follows. For income it has tax um, tax revenue, so from income tax, national insurance, corporation tax, etc. Then you have borrowing, so when we want to bail out a country, a country borrows from other countries. You can also be like if you're in a poor developing country like um, Pakistan, you, where the UK gives aid to Pakistan, so part of Pakistan's income would be aid. And the last thing is government bonds. And the three main areas of expenditure are current expenditure, which is government's day-to-day -day spending. For example, in running the NHS, state schools, things like that. The second is capital expenditure, which is the government spending on building roads, buildings, houses, things like that. And the last area of expenditure is transfer payments, which is basically taxes which are turned into benefits, for example, job seekers allowance, child benefit. Now there's also another area of spending which is debt interest, but we'll talk about that a bit later because at the moment what I've just told you about what public finance is and what are the things which are uh, which are spending and um, expenditure and income of the government public finance. But now what I want to talk about is why should the government spend at all? So this should be clear that why should the government, why not have a free market, why should the government spend? Well there's six reasons why the government should spend and the first is market failure. Because in a free market economy, okay they're self-correcting, self-regulated, but market failures occur. So the government is there to ensure that market failures don't occur, for example asymmetric information uh, market failure. The second is um, public goods. Public goods such as street lighting, nobody wants to provide. Why? Because nobody will profit from this. So the government is there to provide such services and goods. The third is inequality. Now, particularly in recent times, this is a big problem. People want equality, not inequality. So the government is there, and the reason why it spends uh, and the main reason they will do inequality is through transfer payments. It's there to ensure we live in a more equal society. Then the fourth reason is merit goods. So merit goods such as education and fruit, the government will spend money promoting it, making us, encouraging us to have these goods. And on the same side, demerit goods like alcohol and cigarettes, the government will spend money in deterring us from having such things. Another type of... Um, a reason, another type of, another reason why the government does spend money, why we actually have a public finance, is because of externalities. Now, externalities are cost to third parties. So, for example, if we have a small town and there's three factories, and all three factories produce pollution, who is affected by the pollution? The residents of that area. Now, the residents of that area shouldn't have to pay for the pollution because the firm has created it. So the government is there not only to put regulations so that the firms pay for the pollution, but also help to get rid of some of these negative externalities as well as spur some positive externalities. The last reason I want to talk to you about is a multiplier effect. Now, this is because government spending, which we can see through supply side policies, is most popular in term, because of its multiplier effect. It just seems to have a multiplier effect. The government, if it creates jobs, then those people spend, and that increases the spending and the consumption, and then more firms come around. And it, you know, it's just a multiplier effect. So 
These six reasons are the reasons why we have a government and why we have a public finance. But now I think it's important to look at what factors would actually affect public finance. So what factors are going to affect how the government spends money. And here are a few factors I think that it's important to discuss about what determines how the government spends money. The first is the level of real GDP. Now this is because health and education, for example, are income elastic. Now what this means is when incomes go up, people demand less health care and education from the government because they move to the private sector, like Bupa, private schools, you know, etc, etc. So when so if GDP is higher, people are earning more, these things which are income elastic, the government will spend less on them. So current expenditure, the government spends less on. Another determining factor is the demography of a place. So we have an ageing population in the UK. This means that the government has to spend more on healthcare, so that's more current expenditure, and they have to spend more on pensions, so that's more transfer payments. That's another determining factor, because if you look at a developing country, they have a high birth rate, so and they don't have an ageing population, or they don't really have that many elderly people, because their population pyramid is like that. So that means the government spend more on child benefit, as well as health care, but it won't spend it on pensions. So the demography of a place will determine how much a government spends as well. Another thing is political priorities. So we have labour, which is very much for transfer payments, redistribution of income, fairness, equality. Then you can have the Conservatives, which are probably more, oh, spend money on capital expenditure, things like that, getting businesses here. So what are the political priorities? Then you have distribution of income. Now, I mentioned this with Labour already. Now, this is to do with transfer payments. Now, depending on how equal the country is, you can look at on the Lorenz curve, the government will spend um, that much on benefits and taxation, trying to make the society more equal. And the last thing is, how much debt interest does the government have to pay? Because if it has to pay a lot, then it can't spend much on other things. Well, theoretically, it can't, but, you know, it does. So debt interest is really important as well, and how much in debt does the government want to get? So we looked at what is public finances, what are the income and expenditure of um, public finances, why we have a public finance in the first place, and what are the things which affect public finance. Now the second point is what is fiscal policy then? Because what is the differentiation? Now fiscal policy is a policy, basically, it says it in its name. And what it looks at is government spending and taxation. So just like we looked at public finances, it's similar, except public finance is like the balance sheet, and fiscal policy is basically what percentage are you going to set taxation at? What are you? How much um, are you going to be spending? Government spending, and that's what it is. And so you have government spending, and we talked about the various types of government spending, and then we talked about the different types and uh, no, the different incomes the government has. Now I think we should go into tax a bit more because there's a few different types of taxes which are important to talk about. So the government can tax people in two ways, indirectly and directly. Now directly is when the government directly taxes people's incomes. So income tax, national insurance, things like that. It's coming out of your income without you seeing it, without you controlling it. Whereas indirect taxes are taxes on other things. So VAT, uh, VAT, <laughs> VAT and... Um, excess duty on alcohol and things like that so that's how um, the government raises money through tax and we can link this to equality because the government has two types of ways of implementing direct and indirect taxes the first way of implementing these taxes is through a progressive tax which is more to do with direct taxation which is the more you earn the more you'll be taxed so like income tax whereas regressive tax is like a flat rate tax, so like VAT, because what that is, is that you're going to charge all incomes, say 20%, like VAT is, that means that the poorest are hit the hardest because 20% is now a bigger chunk of their income than it is for the greater income, if you're still following what I'm saying. But otherwise, I think the definitions, just remember them, so there's four types of taxes. Now, when the government spends more than it earns, it's in a deficit, it has a deficit, 
and when it tax, if it has more tax revenue or any other type of income through borrowing government bonds, if it has more income than expenditure, then it's called a surplus. And also then we can link this to aggregate demand, which I'll talk about a bit more in the diagram. Now, third point is how can we use this fiscal policy to manipulate public finances? Well, there's two types of fiscal policies, expansionary and contractionary. So with expansionary fiscal policy, what it is is that government spending is greater than taxation, so it's a budget deficit. And why this is expansionary is because basically you're stimulating aggregate demand, you're growing as an economy. And the other type is contractionary, which is the complete opposite. And what you would do is if you realise that the spending is too, too high, then you would implement a contractory policy. But if you realise that you've got so much money coming in that you just got money to waste, then you might, you know, implement an expansion. That's how you connect the two. So now let's talk about the diagram. Now, government spending is a part of aggregate demand because the formula for aggregate demand is C, consumption plus I, investment plus G, government spending plus X minus some, um, exports minus imports. So what I have here is a diagram. This is the price level. This is the real GDP. I've used a classical diagram. So this is the long run aggregate supply, which is completely inelastic. And then this is the short run aggregate supply. Now what I've showed is when aggregate demand increases because government spending is increasing, this is an expansionary fiscal policy, um, we see real growth, Y1 to Y2, and price level increases from P1 to P2. So that's the diagram, fairly simple. At the long run aggregate supply, you have uh, full employment, all the resources are being used. So that's the diagram that I want to talk about. Now I want to talk a bit about the pros and the cons of having a deficit because it is said that having a deficit is better than having a surplus because if you have a surplus that means your economy is shrinking because government spending is falling therefore aggregate demand is falling so you want to have expansionary policy where government spending is rising then so is aggregate demand but you're left with a deficit and what are the benefits of this well we already said it boosts aggregate demand it reduces the output gap so the output gap was this before and now it's this uh, well in the short run and um, there's a multiplier effect which we talked about why we have public finance in the first place and it could also be better for standards of living happiness if the government is doing this redistributing income etc social mobility you can tie that in some of the disadvantages though as you've seen price level goes from p1 to p2 this means that inflation is happening and that might not be so good particularly now when we're seeing like five percent inflation crowding out what this means is that if the, uh, if the government is spending so much, it's using so many resources, and remember, resources are finite, the resources available for the private sector are shrinking, so the private sector shrinks, and are we becoming a state-run economy suddenly? Another thing is opportunity cost, the classical argument, if the government is going to spend money on education, it's the opportunity cost, they could have spent it on X, Y, Z. Um, Foreign direct investment, FDI, drops. Now this is because the government is seen as incompetent because they see they look at the um, they see the government and they say it can't even handle its finances. Like if I was spending more than I'm earning, then they will say she doesn't know how to spend her um, money. I'm not going to bother giving her a loan or investing in her. It's exactly the same thing. And also the size of the government spending is relative to GDP. Now, if it's 5%, then that means that government spending is not too significant, economy is growing, things are fine. But in 2010, the UK's um, public spending, uh, government spending in relation to GDP was just over 40%. Now, that's a lot. Now, that is showing that we're heading towards a state-run economy. That's why, like, the Conservatives, they're very much about cutting back on this, because this is not what we want. And it's not feasible in the long run. Anyways, I hope this video helps. Thank you for watching. Please visit my blog.